It's been four months since the ROG Ally Z1 Extreme was officially released through Best Buy Retail. I pre-ordered this handheld back in early May and was lucky enough to receive it on day one of release, which was June 13th. I devoted an entire day just to setting it up. And after moving over my ROMs and diving into some AAA games, I immediately fell hard for the ROG Ally. It was lightweight, cool to the touch under heavy load, powerful with a considerably better screen than the one on my Steam Deck. However, the honeymoon with the RG Ally was abruptly interrupted a few days in when it began randomly ejecting my SD cards, often right in the middle of a gaming session. I spent days reading up on the issue and troubleshooting until I ultimately decided that this was more headache than I was willing to deal with so early on following the initial purchase. So I exchanged the handheld for a brand new Z1 equivalent at my local Best Buy. Well, guess what? A couple days in, I started having the very same SD card issues with my second unit. And no, these cards had absolutely no issues with my other handhelds. I then made the decision to send this unit in directly to Asus, and it was in their possession for nearly a month. But once the RG Ally made it back to me up until this point, it's been running flawlessly ever since. Throughout my initial rocky journey with the Ally, I almost gave up on this handheld multiple times, and it would have been an easy thing to do with so many handhelds in my possession at the moment. But I can tell you now, I'm glad that I didn't because the Ally has gradually become the device I reach for most consistently in my downtime. So, for this video, we're gonna cover off on all things RG Ally Z1 Extreme as it compares to the Steam Deck, iNeo 1S 7840U, and the iNeo 2 6800U. We'll dive in on the hardware, ergonomics, the specs, software, accessories, some more unconventional than others, and we'll even draw some comparisons against what is probably the biggest threat to the Ally in the coming weeks, the Lenovo Legion Go. So step inside and pull the curtain behind you. These are confessions on the RG Ally from a deck, switch, and iNeo owner. If you asked what I think is RG Ally's strongest selling point for the exterior hardware as compared to other popular PC handhelds, first and foremost, I say it's the seven inch 1920 by 1080p IPS display itself. We're talking a seven millisecond response time, 500 nits max brightness, an sRGB color space of about 100%, 75% Adobe, 120 hertz refresh rate as compared to 60 for the Steam Deck, the iNeo 1S and the iNeo 2. And we can't forget, the Ally Display Panel has that FreeSync Premium wildcard, aka VRR. I don't think any other handheld on the market right now can make this claim. And from what I've read, not even Lenovo Legion Go that's dropping in a few weeks will support VRR in spite of boasting a superior display refresh rate, 144 versus 120. But the Ally Display Panel is far from the only exterior feature that gives it a distinct advantage in the market. There's also the superior fingerprint reader technology that's a bona fide step up from my iNeo devices because it takes an image of your finger the moment you power it on and then it stores that information and uses it to log you into your Microsoft user account all with a single gesture. For iNeo, I have to power on the device, wait for the login screen to load, and then tap the fingerprint reader a second time to log into my user account. And you know what? The four function button placement on the RG Ally, in my opinion, is even better than on the Steam Deck because each of them are so much easier to reach from the thumbsticks. Another exterior feature that I really enjoy on this device is the phenomenal dual front fire and high res speakers, and they support Dolby Atmos and smart amplifier technology. The large XYBA face buttons are also much appreciated because they come much closer to a traditional controller. I'm also a huge fan of the ROG Ally haptics. They're actually really, really good. It's not on the level of the HD rumble as with the Switch, but the vibration is much stronger than what you get with the Steam Deck, and they really do provide a heightened sense of immersion in-game. Now, if you crank up the sensitivity all the way up, they can get a little loud, which is why I like to keep it around 60% but they're nowhere near as loud and buzzy as my iOneal devices. I don't love the Circle D-pad, but I don't hate it either. And the sleek, futuristic, and lightweight build has really started to grow on me, as well as the material and the texture that's used for the outer shell. The grips could be a bit beefier though, as with the Steam Deck, which is why I experimented with 3D printed attachments from a seller on Etsy. However, after using them for some time, I started to feel that the grips were a little too exaggerated and I also couldn't get the best fit for my RG Ally carry cases. If you're interested, I dropped a few links for these third-party hard shell carry cases that I finally settled on after trying way too many cases. I'll also drop a link to these thumb grips as well as this sweet TPU grip case where I actually attached the cell phone kickstand. 
This case material is extraordinarily grippy and it's super easy to remove, so I don't have to worry about the kickstand interfering with docks. The dual fan system is also a leg up on the competition because it allows for quieter operation and more efficient cooling. But it would be irresponsible of me to praise the RDLI cooling system while ignoring the fact Asus probably should have positioned the SD card reader much further away from the left exhaust vent. Now I do want to make it abundantly clear that throughout the entire testing and repair process at the ACES Repair Center, ACES was insistent that there was no concrete evidence to suggest that any of my malfunctions with my unit were due to excessive heat. In fact, after receiving the working unit back, there was little to no information provided at all in terms of what work was actually done. It wasn't until after following up that I received a more detailed explanation, which was that the SD card reader and the main motherboard were quote unquote bad and therefore had not been repaired, but completely replaced in order to solve the issue. But one thing I can say, when I did get it back, I was really glad that I swapped out the 512 gig SSD for a Sabin Rocket 2 terabyte drive during my initial setup process, which did set me back 200 bucks by the way, because all I had to do once I received the unit back was pop that two terabyte drive in, download some Windows updates, and I was off to the races. But it's kind of a shame that Aces didn't go with the 2280 SSD size, because what I paid for a two terabyte drive could have gotten me four. But first the Steam Deck with the 2230, followed by the RG Ally, and now Lenovo Legion Go wants to shake things up even more with going with the 2242. But here's another design choice I don't love for the RG Ally, the proprietary eGPU port. Aside from this locking users down to ACES hardware, I often find myself hunting for the charge port in low light, which is precisely the reason I picked up this simple but ingenious 3D printed cover on Etsy. It clips directly over the eGPU port, but it has a cutout just for the USB-C, making it much easier to locate in a dark room. Moreover, while we're on the topic of exterior gripes, I cannot stand that the Ally power indicator light never shuts off while the device is in use or a cable is attached. You would think at the very least, when it's shut down and charging is complete, that power indicator light would go out, but it doesn't. Once charging is complete, it'll shift from orange to white, but that light will never turn off unless you manually unplug the cable, which is the reason I placed white electrical tape on the TPU grip case. It's transparent enough that I can still see the device status, but it makes the light indicator a lot less distracting. Anyway, when it comes to the internal hardware specs, both the ROG Ally Z1 and the Z1 Extreme come equipped with 16 gigs of LPDDR5 RAM that can support up to 6400 mega transfers, Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2, a 40 watt hour battery, which I wish was 50 in minimum, as on the iNeo 2, but I can only assume that this was a compromise to keep the weight and the dimensions down. So unless Microsoft releases a version of Windows operating system that's dedicated and optimized for handheld gaming, SteamOS will continue to be the unquestionable winner when it comes to providing the best PC consoleized experience. After all, the deck natively launches into a dedicated gaming hub, with the desktop interface being a separate portal that must manually be accessed. And Steam Input just makes controller configuration and customization so easy to implement. However, the ROG Ally Armory Crate software does an impressive job with shouldering a lot of the jank that comes with the territory of using Windows 11 to play video games. And it gives you the ability to remap both a primary and a secondary function for each and every physical button, independent of gamepad and the desktop mode. And you can even achieve this on a more micro, game-specific level. And more recently, left and right sticks and both the left and right triggers can all be calibrated directly in the Armory Crate as well as stick dead zone and trigger pool personalization. On top of that, the ROG Ally Command Center, which boasts a host of customizable and reorganizable hotkeys, is extraordinarily well done, placing really anything that you can possibly need to tweak on top of the game that you're currently playing. Swap between controller modes, adjust resolution and refresh rate, lock and FPS, adjust game visual profiles, close out games in a very deck-like manner, and so, so much more. And with the introduction of Steam Big Picture UI for Windows, if you fancy Steam Input over Armory Crate's controller configuration, you can take advantage of that now as well. Mind you, this is in addition to the well-known Windows PC perks that give it a distinct advantage over Steam OS, such as Game Pass Local Gaming and full Steam Library compatibility. I can't say enough how nice it is to shop Steam's massive game library without having to search for a green checkmark. But overall, it's not all roses for the ally. And my biggest software complaint so far is how Asus distributes updates, placing major BIOS and firmware updates inside my Asus and more micro software updates inside the update center over in the Armory Crate. 
So in addition to traditional Windows updates that live inside the general system settings, I find myself having to navigate three different interfaces just to make sure that I'm caught up and everything is utilizing the latest and greatest. But because this video is coming much later than many others, I'm glad that I don't have to spend a ton of time harping over software issues that have already since been corrected, such as minimal brightness that at launch could only be lowered to a minimum of 25 nits, which was far too bright for late night gaming sessions. And you know what? This is the very same issue that iNeo devices still suffer from to this day. Minimal brightness just isn't low enough for comfortable gaming late at night and it's distracting to others nearby in a dark room. So I went as far as to download third-party software via the Microsoft Store that's called Care UIs. Now this software applies blue light filters and allows for lowering screen brightness beyond the limits of the device manually or based on a set schedule. But since BIOS 323 update for the ROG Ally, which changed minimal brightness from 25 to 10 nits, I've had absolutely no need for this software. BIOS 323 also removed a bug that prevented third-party 65 watt chargers from activating 30 watt turbo mode on the ROG Ally. And it added some additional optimizations for performance mode when plugged into a power source. And obviously there were some modifications made for the fan curves for performance and the turbo modes following the whole SD card craze. My short and sweet takeaway is that the dual fans are noticeably louder since the update under heavy load but they're not nearly as loud as they are on the Steam Deck and my Ioneo devices under similar stress load. As for the silent mode, it's literally just that, quiet as a mouse. However, it's important to note that silent mode can cause some major issues depending on the game that you're playing. Some games will experience audio crackling if Adobe Atmos and audio enhancements are enabled because the system just isn't able to draw enough power from silent to support it. So I decided to switch up the parameters a bit from the 1S review where I ran benchmarks for the 1S, the ROG Ally, Steam Deck, and a few others at 720p resolution, medium graphics preset without FSR or any other upscaling features enabled. This time around, I ran benchmarks at the 720p resolution as well, but I dropped graphics down to low preset and I enabled FSR with the balanced configuration. And I'm going to focus on the Ally, the 7840U, and the Steam Deck. All drivers and BIOS are up to date using the latest and greatest, which means that the ROG Ally is currently using BIOS 330. And for good measure, during my test, I kept each device plugged into a 65 watt PD charger. First up, Cyberpunk 2077 for the ROG Ally at 15 watts, which pulled in an average FPS of 51.3 versus 51.03 for the 7840U. However, the Steam Deck actually inched out both the Ally and the 7840U at 15 watts with an average FPS of 53.2, whereas interestingly enough, for my previous test run using medium graphics preset at 15 watts, the deck beat out every other device but the ROG Ally. On the other hand, at a 20 watt TDP, the ROG Ally shot up to the top with an impressive average just shy of 70 FPS, 69.34 precisely about a two frames average increase over the 7840U at 66.96 FPS. However, at a 25 watt TDP, the Ally created a solid amount of separation from the 7840U with an average FPS of 77.21 versus 70.22 for the 1S. I thought this was really interesting because the 1S actually dominated the Ally for this title at 25 watts using medium graphics preset without the help of SSR on the device. On the flip side, for Guardians of the Galaxy at 15 watts, the ROG Ally beat out all of the competition at both medium and low graphics preset parameters. As shown here, graphics low, FSR enabled, the Ally pulled in an average of 55 FPS at 15 watts, 69 at 20 watts, and 70 at 25 watts. And at medium preset without FSR, the Ally pulled in an average FPS of 60 at 15 watts, 69 at 20 watts, 72 at 25 watts, and so on. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the deck actually returned to the top at 15 watts with an impressive average FPS of 52 at low preset versus 47 for the Ally and 37 for the 7840U. At 20 watts, the Ally actually barely inched out the deck which had 52 average FPS at 15 watts, 53 on the Ally versus 52 for the deck. But as you can see, the 1S was actually still behind the deck at 20 watts and even at 25 watts. I ran a number of other test runs off camera for all these handhelds. The 7840U is undoubtedly a powerful APU, but from my experience, it appears that outside a handful of situations, the Z1 Extreme and the DEC Custom Van Gogh APU appear to be better optimized and upscale efficient within the thermal capabilities of these handheld form factors. 
For me, the biggest testament of just how good the RGLi Z1 Extreme is, in spite of how quickly the handheld market is becoming saturated, is just how hard I fought for it. If I didn't think that this device was special, I would have returned it back to Best Buy for a full refund at the first sign of trouble and moved on. And I'm not going to lie, the thought did cross my mind once or twice when the second unit started to fail. But deep down, I knew I'd be doing myself a disservice because this PC handheld, the form factor, the specs, the pricing, retail accessibility, and the software that supports it catapults the ROG Ally to a place that can only be trumped by a comparable device with insurmountable and indisputable industry advantages. I'm talking about no other than Valve Steam Deck that's not only leveraging native SteamOS operating system, but the gargantuan Steam storefront itself. So placing these advantages aside, I'm going to go on record to say that the ROG Ally has come closest to providing a true consoleized experience for me on Windows OS, even with the addition of ISpace 2.0. I'm also going to go on record to say that outside of my Switch handheld, the ROG Ally's engineering does a better job than any of my other handhelds with minimizing the transfer of heat to where my hands rest. And the smoothness that the 120Hz VRR screen provides is just unmatched right now. I also believe that the Adobe Atmos tuned speakers are second to none. And the placement of all four function buttons at the top are in perfect reach of the thumbsticks and the ergonomics are considerably improved from this. But the thing that troubles me the most where the ally is concerned is that most people will probably never get to experience these strengths firsthand because of the widely shared SD card issues so early on in the product lifecycle. But in spite of the praise that I have for the Ally, there are a handful of design changes that I would have loved to see. First and foremost, there are clearly some quality control issues going on over at Asus. Because again, they were very, very insistent that heat was not what caused my reader to fail. But even in spite of this, the second change that I would make is relocating the SD card slot to the bottom of the device far away from the dual exhaust vents. Thirdly, if we ever see a hardware refresh, I'd like to see complete removal of this proprietary eGPU port. And I honestly don't care that it can support slightly higher bandwidths because it's so darn expensive. No one is buying the RTX 3080 anyway. Thunderbolt 4 supporting third-party eGPUs such as on many iNeo devices is all that is needed here. The volume button placement also makes for a very awkward reach. And if the grips were just a tad bit beefier and the thumbsticks symmetrical, ergonomics wouldn't be great. It'd be borderline perfect. But I have to say, seeing how much I enjoy this handheld, leveraging the Z1 Extreme APU, has me very excited about the imminent launch of the Lenovo Legion Go, which again has a number of advantages over the Ally on paper, such as faster RAM, 144Hz versus 120, 8-inch display versus 7, 1600p versus 1080p, Thunderbolt 4, eGPU support, a mouse trackpad, a slightly larger battery, and of course, beefier, removable controllers. However, on that same spec comparison sheet, it's important to note that the Ally still has a number of distinct advantages, such as a smaller form factor and weight, VRR, fingerprint reader, fantastic front firing speakers, and what I feel is a more ideal layout for the view and menu buttons, which are right up there next to the thumbsticks. While Legion Go is going to have both the view and the menu buttons near the bottom of the controller on the left side, which means you'll have to stretch your finger down to pause your game, for example. And I worry if Legion Go's top firing speakers will mean a less immersive experience, as a lot of people, including myself, like to angle the handheld slightly for a better view and experience. So I'm wondering if that means that the speakers will essentially be firing in the opposite direction of where you're sitting. But yeah, I pre-ordered the Lenovo Legion Go Z1 Extreme 1TB but I'm already anticipating that I'm gonna really miss VRR, the amazing sound quality on the Ally, and the fingerprint reader. Nevertheless, I'm so looking forward to that 8.8 inch, 1600p QHD IPS display, the faster RAM transfer speeds, the larger battery, the trackpad, and I'll have to see how I end up feeling about the detachable controllers. Hoping it doesn't feel too gimmicky, and that the points where the controller is attached to the console don't end up feeling loose over time, as with the Switch Joy-Cons. I think if the controller could be used separately for co-op, as with the Switch Joy-Cons, I'd be a little bit more excited, because when it comes to FPS shooters, I generally prefer a controller versus a mouse. No matter what, the Legion Go is gonna have some pretty big shoes to fill for me, coming from the Ally. Now that's not to say that it can't surpass the Ally as my favorite PC handheld, but much of this is really riding on Lenovo's integrated software. How polished Legion Space will be and how well it achieves the goal of providing a more consoleized experience on a PC platform.
If any of the items shown throughout caught your eye, make sure to check out the description. And if you made it to the end of this video, drop a comment, too many handhelds. And while you're at it, what's the handheld you're using the most right now? Also, for those playing Spider-Man 2, how are you liking that so far? As always, thanks for watching and supporting the channel, and I will see you guys in the next one.